I, I bear the shame that I actually struck out at T-ball. <laughs> now, come on, it was two fouls in a, you know, in a windmill, but still, I, I, I bear the shame to this day. I was watching my little granddaughter play her first uh, T-ball game, and I remembered way back to when my daughter, her mom, played T-ball. And uh, I don't know if it was the first game of the season or not, but one of the, one of the first games, uh, we went down to the field and they asked if someone, they wanted a couple of dads or moms to serve as, I don't know what we were, referees, uh, you know, monitors, precepts, say trap. We were the people who would, you know, not the umpire behind the plate. Why, why would you, you can't, you don't call strikes in t-ball, but uh, so they, I volunteered and I was out by first base, you know, uh, uh, waiting, I'm, I'm going to make the call if, you know, safe or out or whatever, and then right next to me, uh, as the first base coach was our team's coach, uh, you know, because uh, when, the, when our team's up to bat, our coach is there, and when the other team's up to bat, their coach is there, and so I'm standing there. It's the other team up to bat, and uh, this one little guy, I don't know, he got, a, you know, he got a, a piece of it, and he ran, you know how they do, they run halfway to first base before they realize they're supposed to let go of the bat, and, and there's a rule, I think it's just a t-ball rule, you know, when the runner goes to first, um, if you turn, you know, to the outside, then you can overrun the base. But if you don't turn to the outside, if you go straight or turn towards second, then all the first baseman has to do is touch first base and you're out or something like that. And so this guy gets a piece of it and he runs down, he throws the bat down and he comes running past first and he goes past the base, but he goes about halfway down the foul line just kind of running out of, you know, letting the steam run out. And he turns around and comes back, and he's just excited because he hit the ball and got to run and all that. And so everybody looks at me, you know, because technically he should be out because he didn't turn to the right when he overran first. But I, you know, looked at it, and I said, hey, he wasn't trying to get away with anything. He wasn't trying to, you know, steal second. To, so let's give the kid a break. You know, he's safe. Or, yeah, safe. And I'm standing next to the, our coach. You know, our, our kids are in the field. And he looks at me, and he says, you're just too damn honest. And I wondered, is that even possible? <laughs> You know, one of the traits, oh, I forgot to tell you, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 2. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, I'll just tell you that one of the traits that characterize the lives of Christians or ought to characterize the lives of Christians is, is personal integrity and honesty. Now, that's not to say that, you know, you have to have a personal relationship with Jesus to play t-ball, but honesty and integrity do characterize a life given over to the Lord. You know, just tell it like it is. Don't, don't fib. Don't stretch the truth. Don't make stuff up. Just tell the truth. See, a, a pattern of dishonesty really is a form of hypocrisy. And hypocrisy well, it does two things. It shows that the person is self-deceived about their relationship with the Lord, and it gives the unbelieving world, you know, uh, an open shot to criticize and mock the church. And in this second chapter of Romans here, Paul's been making the case that all men, for him Jew and Gentile, but really everyone, uh, are equal before the Lord, regardless of their ethnic or religious heritage. And starting at verse 17, he makes some strong points about the value of honesty and how it's reflected in our lives. So let's start at verse 17 and just read about nine verses down through verse 24. Now remember, we're coming in the middle of something here. He's making this point about where we all stand on equal footing before the Lord. And he says, indeed, you're called a Jew, 
and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. Now this passage describes a life characterized by inconsistency. See, when your life reflects your faith, you're, you're just going to be honest. First of all, you're going to be honest with others. You know, inconsistency that he talks about here is, you know, those guys, they, you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. Your mouth says one thing, but really your life says something entirely different. And again, inconsistency is a form of hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy, of course, means pretending to be one thing when you're really another. Uh, Guys, can you put that picture up on the screen? There it is. You need to recognize that as the symbol for thespian organizations, actors, the sad face, the happy face. That really comes from the idea of a hypocrite. Really one thing, pretending to be another. In other words, two-faced, what that picture literally shows. Now, those of you that remember the televangelist scandals of the 1980s will remember how the press and the world just took advantage of that opportunity to really gang up on the church. I mean, is any surprise that when a TV preacher who proclaims the, the value of purity and, you know, the dangers of promiscuity, gets caught with a prostitute, and the whole world just says, ah, those Christians are all just a bunch of hypocrites. You know, it's funny, of all the sins that Jesus confronted and, I guess, in a sense, tolerated, he, he rarely, if ever, tolerated hypocrisy. Remember the story in John 8 about the the woman caught in adultery? There's a feast of the Jews, and, you know, I don't know what happened the night before, but Jesus is there in the temple courts, and a bunch of angry religious men come, and they literally kind of throw this gal down at his feet. And they're, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him. They say, you know, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says she must be stoned to death. And now what Jesus didn't do was say, well, that's one way to interpret the law. But you know, if you look at the original language and twist and bend it a little bit, actually, you know, just, just, uh, you know, a sharp stick in the eye will do it. (laughs) No, he didn't do that. But what he did do, implicit in his actions, he agreed that, yeah, that's, that's what the law of Moses said. So, fellas, you who are without sin, throw the first stone. And you know, they just had to be there with their rocks in their hands, and they're kind of salivating, and oh, we're going to get her. And then they, you know, we're going to get him, we're going to trick him and trap him. And now they're going, "Mm, he got us again. And one by one, the Bible says, they dropped those rocks and walked away. Nobody was innocent of sin. And then the one person who could have thrown the stone at her, who qualified, he who has no sin. Instead, he just looked at her and he he said, you know, I don't condemn you. Now, just go and sin no more. You know, I'm not going to throw a rock at you. Just go and, you know, knock knock it off. (laughs) Knock that stuff off. Remember, in Luke 19, Jesus comes across a tax collector. 
Zacchaeus. Jesus and his guys are walking by, and Zacchaeus, I guess he was a little guy, he climbs up in a tree, and he's just making a ruckus, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, you know, and, and Jesus, you know, sees him, and I remember my friend Gail Irwin says, Jesus already has him treed, and the guy doesn't even know he's being hunted. And so he says, come down out of that tree. Tonight we have dinner at your house. And so all the religious people are just about to turn inside out like a slug with salt on him. Who's going to go to the house of that tax collector? What's wrong with this guy? Now, Zacchaeus is so honored and really so moved that as they are eating the meal there, he looks at Jesus and he says, you know what? I'm going to... I'm going to give back anything that I might have stolen. And, and anybody that feels I ripped them off in the, you know, my tax collecting, I'm going to pay them back fourfold. If I stole $100, I'm going to give them back 400 And what does Jesus say? <laughs> he says, today salvation has come to your house. He doesn't say, you rat. You know, you dirty, rotten, you know, you're a turncoat to the nation of Israel and you're a, an extortionist because you charge somebody so much tax and you pocket most of it and give the rest to the government. He just says, you know what, Zacchaeus, that lack of hypocrisy, that willingness to do the right thing, tell the truth, be honest, means that salvation came to your house today. You know, prostitutes, thieves, and all the rest, they all received grace, mercy, forgiveness, restoration. But the hypocrites, Jesus didn't pull any punches. He called them, you brood of vipers, you whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Yikes. You know, it's better to be honest about the things you struggle with than to pretend you have no struggles and get caught in a lie, right? I got a friend who's a pastor down in California, and several years ago, he was driving to church on a Sunday morning, and he, he you know, in the car in front of him, he could tell that the husband and wife were just going at it. You know, he could see the back of their heads, and he's going, oh, yeah, well, you, oh, yeah, no, you don't. And the hands are flying, and the hair's flopping, and they're just, you know, and, and then he follows them. They turn into the church. <laughs> and so what he does is he follows them right into the parking lot, and he goes and he parks right next to them. And they get out of the car, and they go, Pastor, how great to see you. Praise the Lord on this beautiful Sunday morning. And he said, you get back in the car and work this out. Don't you dare pretend that everything's okay when I've been watching you just tear each other apart. Be honest. I know I had a church for several years up north of here in La Center, and there was one particular couple in our church, Steve and Becky, and man, they were plugged in. They were there every Sunday, home Bible study in their home. I mean, if there was a retreat, women's retreat, men's retreat, she was at it, he was at it. They were, you could just depend on them to be there along with their family. And so one Sunday when they weren't there, they were conspicuously absent. You know, it was so unusual for them to miss church. So the next week, they, they came in, and I said, hey, you know, uh, we really missed you guys last week. And I remember, never forget, Becky looked at me, and she said, well, we had a fight in the car on the way here, so we turned around and went home. And I thought, bless your heart for just telling the truth. He didn't say, well, we didn't feel good, or we had another obligation, we got a flat tire, we ran out of gas, we had to call AAA. You know, it was none of that stuff. It's just, yeah, we got in a big fight and turned around and went home because we didn't feel like coming to church. I said, thank you. Just thank you for being so honest about it. See, here's the real problem. People watch us, God's people, and they see our hypocrisy and our dishonesty And they blame the Lord. That's just exactly what it said in verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So what's the solution? Well, be honest about who you are. 
Be honest with others. Be honest about who you are. You know, as we stop trying uh, to look like we deserve God's love and instead just surrender to his grace, except, you know, once and for all that he loves and accepts you just the way you are, no matter what, uh, then you can be honest about your flaws and your failures. You can take off that mask of hypocrisy and simply be honest with everyone about everything. You know, it's funny. It's one of those things, and maybe the t-ball coach was right. I don't know, but I just have never had a problem being completely open, honest, and transparent with just about anyone. And when, whether it, you know, I just tell the truth, uh, I'm shaggy do because I'm losing my hair and I'm growing out what's left while I can. You know, it's not a fashion statement. And even if I wore a, a military uniform and stood at attention, I'd still look like an old hippie farmer in a pair of bib overalls because that's who I am, you know, and I can't hide it. And I don't try to hide it, and I'm, I'm not saying that to lift myself up. It, you know, it works against you sometimes. But officer... Uh, yeah, I was going 75. No, I have never said that once in my life. Now, I've said I wasn't paying attention. My mind was, a, you know, a million miles away, and I wasn't thinking about how fast I was, and, and sometimes that works, and sometimes you get written up, you know? But just that being honest with other people about yourself, about who you are, with the things you struggle with, and don't pretend and don't try to hide. Don't be hypocritical. Don't be one person on the outside when you know you're someone else on the inside. God values that. When your life reflects your faith, you're going to be honest with others. And... Maybe even more importantly, you're, you're going to be honest with yourself. You know, merely looking like a believer really has no value. Look at verse 25. He says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, if that's a little too tangled up for you like it is for me, Sometimes I think these New King James guys put all the words in a Yahtzee cup and shook them up and rolled them out, and now I'm supposed to make sense of it. So I looked at the New Living Translation, which is much simpler, even though it is a paraphrase. But here's, I think it makes, makes it clearer. Uh, this is Romans 2.25 in the New Living. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you're no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. You know, you don't try to look honest on the outside or look like a Christian or whatever it is you're trying to look like. Uh, you know, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be dishonest just because it won't help you. You know, the, the, these guys, these, uh, you know, uh, circumcision's great if you're going to follow the law of Moses. But if you don't obey the law, the, that, that appearance of, you know, being one of God's people just doesn't mean anything. You know, symbols are just that. They're, they're symbols. It's the reality that counts. The symbol in this verse was circumcision. If you go back to, I mean, you don't have to turn there now, but if you go back to Genesis 17, you'll see that circumcision was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. It could be any sign. It could be a fish or a dove on your car. You know, it could even be baptism or communion or maybe a cross necklace, you know, or earrings or something or the little cross that hangs from your rear view mirror in your car. Uh, I mean, if you want to wear a symbol of your faith, that's great. But be honest with yourself. You know the real you, so be the real you. And if the real you is something you'd rather hide, then maybe it's time that you just, you know, as they say, let go and let God change you. A God-centered life is something that happens from the inside out, not the outside in. 
Look at verse 26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he's not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he who is a Jew who, who is one inwardly, and, uh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. You know, don't... Uh, if you're going to present yourself as some sort of, you know, Ned Flanders, <laughs> oakley doakley neighbor, then that better be who you are, because if you pretend to be that, but you're really not, then what you appear to be doesn't mean anything. And you can appear to be the biggest, baddest, meanest, you know, worst sinner in the world, but if you're actually living for the Lord, connected to the Lord, walking in fellowship with the Lord, and filled with his spirit, you know, then you're good to go, no matter what it looks like on the outside. Here's how the New Living Translation has those verses I just read. It says, if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law, but don't obey it. See, it's not symbols or rituals or formulas or traditions. It's about your heart and God's spirit. And when you're honest with yourself, you know that. We all know that. When your life reflects your faith, you're going to be honest with yourself. And when your life reflects your faith, you're going to be honest with the Lord. I had an experience once. It's twice in my life. Well, yeah, the past what? 30 plus years where I felt that the Lord actually spoke to me, not in an audible voice, but you know, it wasn't just that same voice that rattles around nonstop that I wish would shut up at night so I could sleep. It wasn't that guy. There was a whole other thing that just impressed uh, uh, you know, a secret on my heart, and the first one had something to do with breaking some bad habits I had. The other one was this or words to this effect. So, if you want to know me, says the Lord, if you want to know me as well as I already know you, then stop hiding stuff. Because you're not hiding it. I know it all. So just step up in good, bad, or indifferent, let it be. And that's the only way that we'll ever get to know the Lord the way he already knows us. The, the, the word was uh, expurgated, you know, purged outwardly. God knows all those big words. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Well, much in every way. Chiefly because to them, that is to the Jews, were, to Israel, were committed the oracles of God, you know, the scriptures, what we call our Old Testament. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it's written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, 
What shall we say? Now watch these rhetorical questions here. If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? Or how could God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let's do evil, that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. What, what, what a crazy idea. You know, God forgives sin. And every time he forgives a sin, it's, it's like putting his grace and mercy and compassion and, and, you know, forgiveness, his loving character on display. So here's what I'll do. I'm going to go nuts and give in to the flesh. And then when God forgives me, it'll just make God look that much better. You think? <laughs> no. No, he says that's crazy. Certainly not. See, these kinds of rhetorical questions, believe me, I've heard them all. You get into one of those pastor Q&A things, and it always comes up, well, you know, is it, why is it bad to smoke pot? Well, and now it's like, and it's legal. <laughs> well, you know, it's because a guilty conscience gets in the way of a relationship with the Lord. Why can't I steal? Why can't I be unfaithful to my wife? Why can't I drive as fast as I want? Why can't I kidnap kids and sell them on the you know, human trafficking market? I mean, little things, big things from one extreme to the other. It doesn't work. Yeah, but, you know, we, we've been together for all these years and we never, man, we never managed to make it down to the courthouse and get married and we've got a couple of kids and it's like, well, you know, well, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of folks out there these days that that's their story. And, you know, God does not send lightning bolts and fire and brimstone down on our houses, does he? No, he, he loves and, and he forgives when we're honest with him, when we simply, you know, say, Lord, this is just where I'm at. I, I spent a summer living in a tent in my ex-wife's backyard. <laughs> I had a mattress in the tent, so it wasn't so bad. And a, fl and a power cord that ran in the window. But, you know, I, I, it happened right here at Crossroads. I was new to the Lord, really new. And I had only been here a few times, and I was well aware of all my shortcomings and sin. And, and one day, you know, I sort of, you know, after the service, I saw the pastor and I went over there and followed him around until finally nobody else was around. And I said, Pastor, have you got a minute? And, you know, I realize now that he really didn't, but he took a minute. And he, and he said, yeah, what can I help you with? And I said, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm divorced, but, you know, uh, this, this career as an uh, unlicensed pharmaceutical representative just just isn't working out and and I don't have any money and I had to move back in with my ex-wife not that we fell back in love and solved all of our issues but you know my folks own the house that she and the kids live in and so I pulled up and I've been staying there and he kind of thought for just a minute, and I realized, like I said, now I realize he had, you know, it was between services, and he had like three minutes before he had to go, and he, and he just looked me right square in the eye, and he didn't say it harshly, he said it lovingly, and, but authoritatively. He said, it's a sin for you to live with her like that. And so I went, well, if it's a sin to live with her like that, then I'm not going to live with her like that anymore. And I went home and got the tent, put it in the backyard, put a mattress in it, ran a power cord out so I could listen to the radio and stuff. And I sat out there in the, in the you know, the, 
light that I had rigged up and I read the Bible and, and prayed and, and thought about it. And, and I was just honest with God. And I, was, I didn't have to think about it is the thing. It wasn't a real inner struggle. It was like, oh, this kind of life blesses God. This kind of life doesn't. Now, God didn't say I'd go to hell, but I know that it just doesn't bless God. And nobody laid a trip on me and condemned me and shook their finger in my face. They just pointed out the, the bare, honest truth that, you know, it's a sin to do that. And so my response was, I'm not going to do that anymore. And that was whatever, sometime in June or July, and it was August, September. And, you know, I'd been... Uh, uh, I, I had been coming to church here at Crossroads, and uh, after, a, you know, a couple of times, uh, I started taking the kids to come to Sunday school with me. They were little then. And uh, I remember I brought home this little Gospel of John that I had picked up on the information table, and I gave it to my wife, my ex-wife, you know, and she was going, Boy, you know, how long is this kick going to last? You know, last week it was Taekwondo. What's it going to be now? You know, he's going to be a religious guy. When I gave her this Gospel of John, and I said, look, you know, you don't have to read it if you don't want to, but if you do, just read it. I'm not going to bug you. I'm not going to, you know, preach at you or to you. I don't know enough myself to have much to say. And so I just left it there with her, and I'm out in the tent every night and hanging out with the kids during the day. And, and then finally one Sunday morning, I, I got, went and took the kids, getting ready to go to church, and I said, well, do you want to go to church? And she said, well, okay. And so we all went to, the, to church. And then it was right over in the chapel. And I don't remember what the Bible study was about, uh, but at the end of the message, just like Pastor Daniel does, he gave an opportunity for people to respond to what the Lord had said to them or moved within their hearts. And, you know, in those days, it was with every head bowed and every eye closed. And so we were down like this. And when he said amen, and I looked up, and she was gone. And she had gone back in that prayer room. And, and prayed to receive the Lord. And a couple of weeks or a couple of months really went by. I think it was in September, and we were standing in the kitchen one day, and I said, you know, we probably should just get married again. <laughs> because, you know, in the whole seven years we were divorced, neither one of us had a serious relationship, and it was just like, look, we got a lot of issues to work on, but you're my partner and I'm pretty sure I'm yours and so we did in September the day after our daughter's birthday got married back in the old prayer room there with Pastor Ratz if anybody remembers him just you know all of that just from being honest with God you know he could have said it's a sin to live with her like that and I could I could have said well then I guess I'm a sinner and that would have been the end of that. But just being honest with God and responding to him, you know, here's the thing. What, he, what he's getting at in this chapter, first part of chapter 3, God's righteousness requires that he keep his promises. You know, he, he, he can't lie. He, he's always truthful. He's always honest. And the Jewish Christians in Rome, which is where this letter was written to, see, they were still counting on God's covenant relationship with Israel and God's faithfulness to that covenant to ensure their salvation. But what Paul's saying in a roundabout way is that it's a two-way street. You know, God's righteousness not only requires that he keeps his promises, it also requires a response to sin. And if you're honest with yourself and you're honest with God, you won't be able to ignore sin in your life. Not because God will reject you. That's not on the table. It's because sin just gets in the way. 2 Timothy Paul wrote to Timothy in chapter 2. He says, this is a true stay, saying, if we die with him, we will also live with him. 
If we endure hardship, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. No one ever expected God to deal with sin and keep his covenants and make salvation available to everything, but that's exactly what he's done on the cross. You know, Jesus is the one that God promised Abraham would be a blessing to all the families of the world. Jesus is the one, the first, last, and only one ever to fulfill man's side of God's covenant with Israel. I heard a guy once say Jesus was the, the only good Jew. And I think that that's exactly right. Jesus is the one who, even though he knew no sin, became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. And when you're honest with God, honest enough to stop asking silly questions about what you can get away with that just really challenge his integrity, honest enough to admit that if you're left to your own devices, your own wisdom and your own strength, you don't have it all together. When we're honest enough to confess our sin, then 1 John 1, 9 says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you got to be honest. You got to be honest with everybody else. You got to be honest with yourself. And you got to be honest with God. Uh, as the worship team comes out, I'll wrap this up. You know, my dad was not perfect, but when I was little, I thought he was. My dad was a combination of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, what's the guy's name? Lorne Green on Bonanza. You know, the dad. Cartwright, whatever his first name was, combination of him and Andy of Mayberry. But he had this, he grew up in Mississippi, man, in the 20s and 30s, and he had this strong Judeo-Christian ethic. We weren't a church-going family or anything close to it, but he had this Judeo-Christian ethic of honesty and integrity, and he didn't tell a lie, and he didn't take what wasn't his. And if somebody gave him change and they gave him a penny too much, he did the math in his head and gave him back the penny every time. And he did this once, I, I, I'll never forget it. We was, you know, my dad was a musician. That's kind of where I get it. And I had gone to play a gig with them at some American Legion Hall somewhere. I think I was about nine. You know, they'd get little Ronnie up on a chair, and I'd sing out behind the barn, and then I'd go sleep on the coats. And so on the way home, the folks stopped. It's like now it's 2, 3 in the morning, and they stopped off this place, kind of a tradition to get breakfast, to stop and eat. I think really it was to sober up a little, but I'm just guessing at that. And, and so we went in and we had our stuff. I, had a, I remember I always got a toasted tuna sandwich. There you go. And we come out of the place and the drummer in the band went over. And so it was Saturday night. Now it was Sunday morning. And the Sunday papers are in the paper box. And the drummer in the band, he pulls out, you know, whatever it was, probably a quarter back in the olden days. And he put it in the paper machine and he lifted up the thing and he grabbed the paper and he put it under his arm. Then he grabbed another one and looked at my dad and said, here, you want one? And put it in my dad's hand and let go of the thing and it was closed. So my dad reached in and got a quarter and went over and put it in the machine because that's how honest he was. And that was an incredible example. Jesus gives us life. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And he still loves and accepts us just as we are. He gives us his spirit, you know, the strength to be honest and live an honest life free from pretense and hypocrisy. And what does he ask in return? Just our affection, our attention, our devotion, our trust, our pride, really ourselves, our lives. 
And you know, let's just be honest here. What could be better than that? Father, we are so grateful for the forgiveness that we so require 